Welcome everybody. I'm QX from the Sigma Knots, and today we are going to talk about the state of gaming uh, in the Ergo ecosystem and maybe a little bit in the overall ecosystem as a whole. And with me, I have Mick. Mick, do you mind for the people who don't know who you are and, and kind of what you do? Yeah, of course. My name is Mick. I am the founder and lead game designer for a gaming project being worked on called Blitz TCG, trading card game on the blockchain. That's awesome. Really excited about that. We had a, a interview with you, Ergo Pulse, Dan and I did yeah. uh, a month or so ago. So anybody watching wants to jump back on that, feel free to. A lot of laughs during that one for sure. It was a Defi good time. Definitely don't want to run the B-roll on that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. So let's jump right in. Um, uh, so Mick, what I'm wondering is, so start off like from the base. Tell me about kind of your experience and our perception um, with either blockchain gaming or gaming in general, like a game you'd find on the app store or mm -hmm. the play store, or even on places like steam. What's your, what's your overall general perception about those kind of games? Yeah, I think there's certainly a lot of good games out there. So we're not talking about all games here, but there are many games that have fallen into the cycle of, I'd say aggressive user monetization that comes with things like loot boxes and skins. And then just generally wanting to resell you the same thing that you've already bought once. Uh, good example of that most recently uh, in my mind, Overwatch. I'm a long time Overwatch player, played very a lot, I played the game a lot and very competitively for a long time. They basically released Overwatch 2, where you got to bring over some of your stuff, but not all of it. And it was effectively just a reskin of the first game. You know, so people had to end up repurchasing some things. They lost some credits and for no real reason other than a uh, company just decided to do that, right? Like, you know, you, the user didn't have a choice. Nobody had a choice. Um, there was no accountability for that. And there's a lot of games that have fallen in, into that cycle lately, especially from the monetization and loot box perspective. So my perception of it, I would say multiplayer games right now specifically is that many of them are looking to pad their bottom line and have have pushed the users to the side uh, in order to get that done. Um, and that's something that's uh, sort of disappointed me growing up in the early 90s, uh, getting to live through, I would, I would say, the, the best era of gaming to today. It's been, it's been tough to see that. You know, that's a good point. I didn't think that those were the best errors of gaming and that, that you're totally right. Mm -hmm. Sitting in front of your little CRT monitor, yep. banging out <laughs> on your little console or yep. firing up. I used to go to my visit. My, my brother's much older than me. And when he was in med school, I used to go to his house and his wife had this, um, I don't think it was, it was Apple two E or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I had those big five and a quarter and whatever the size those were floppies yeah. that had, um, like the Olympics, uh, California yeah. gaming or something, I'd pop it in and you do like this half pipe or you do like the yeah, yeah, yeah. or that kind of thing. Those were the, you can't get those days back. That's for damn sure. Back, dude. And, yeah, pop, and in, your, in your mind, they're like in 4K resolution too. And oh then, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. It's weird. It's weird how vivid this, <clears throat> I don't know. You know, you, we, did, we all did a lot of stuff growing up, but I mean, I have a lot of memories from playing video games because it's always just like these fun, silly moments that you kind of, Remember, right? And they stick with you for really your entire life. Yeah, Super Nintendo, Nintendo, GameCube, all of them, man. I got memories on each and every console that has probably ever been released. It's, it's pretty cool. That's cool. <laughs> so, so without getting too philosoph philosophical into yeah. this, you know, I'm, I'm, I visit Reddit quite a bit, or I have in mm -hmm. the past. Um, and and you, see, you see the common thing with these games is, look, you know, EA is coming out with loot boxes. Do yep. not pre-order the damn game. Don't. Yep. It doesn't matter. There's plenty of people, plenty of whales, plenty of people to oh, pre-order yeah. these games and just continue to feed the bottom line of the companies that are churning these money makers out. Yep. How do we? How how do you envision uh, competing against that kind of thing? Yeah, I I don't think, frankly, there's much competing with it, right? Like these organizations and their method of marketing is pretty ingrained in society. It's like going up against a Titan with, you know, multi-million dollar marketing budget. It actually reminds me of this whole kick versus Twitch thing going on right now, where kick is basically just 
poaching the the Twitch streamers because Twitch made such a bad business decision with regards to their payment structure. Basically, you know, once you are up against a, an organization that is able to output more than you with regards to marketing, they will naturally attract more users. However, there is an opportunity in this space in general to show people a different way of doing things. And as you said, not getting too philosophical about it, but but I think this simplest way to put it is we can show people that with a less greed-centric mindset, i.e. requiring users to purchase something twice, not making something open source because you want to keep it proprietary and under your umbrella. If you, if you make something open source and you take a, a less greedy approach with how user assets like collectibles and whatnot can transfer between games and between players, all of a sudden that, in my opinion, creates a very healthy ecosystem for both the game and the player. Uh, and then I think over time, organically, that mentality has the potential to push people away from you know, this big big business marketing style, like almost gambling in some ways uh, with the loot boxes approach that they've, they've pushed, they pushed out um, <laughs> aggressively, let's say. I couldn't think of the right word, aggressively uh, in the past five, six, seven years. I mean, was I, I may be imagining this, but I swear yeah. there was something somewhere that said that when they were figuring out these methods of getting people like on these app store games that you see these advertisements for literally they're hiring um, psychologists and psychiatrists or yep. psychologists, I guess, to try to see what is going to be the best way to trigger these people into returning and pushing that button and staying stuck to that kind of game. Oh yeah. There's full, full divisions of these mega corporations that are dedicated to understanding what, people click on there's i mean there's a, some scary things out there and cool things too that are coming out like with apple apple's new vision vision pro or whatever like that's an amazing piece of technology if you haven't watched a video on it anybody listen to this i highly recommend going to do that afterwards but an interesting thing because you know augmented reality there's 16 cameras on that device and they're going to be able to know what you're looking at when you look at it so if you prefer the color red, maybe you don't even know you prefer the color red. It's going to be able to tell you that you prefer the color red and then give you advertisements that uh, are more inclined towards that preference. Therefore, you are more likely to, the way you click with it is by touching your fingers together, you're more likely to click on that ad because it was tinted red. That is scary to me. <laughs> I don't like that at all. <laughs> so, yeah, man. Now you're not only going to have to hide your um, browsing history from your wife, but also your eye tracking history. All of it, dude. <laughs> I mean, that's terrifying. Yeah, geez, Louise. Oh, goodness. All right. So you started to kind of uh, edge into my next question, actually, which is great. Yeah. Um, how How is what you're working for different or towards different than what you just explained, kind of what the, you know, you didn't say the whole industry, but you said mm -hmm. a meat of the major players of that industry are headed towards. How is, how is what you're doing are headed towards different? Yeah, so Blitz TCG, um, if you've ever played uh, Hearthstone or Gwent um, or any of these online trading card games, very similar in style and approach to those games, probably more similar to, to Hearthstone, I would say, or, or MTG Online, Magic the Gathering Online. Um, we we took a step back, and really I took a step back, and I said, all right, well, of all those games I just listed, I'm sure there's more out there. Number one, none of them are open source, not a single one. And what that means for people who are less familiar with that phrase, all open source means is uh, you as a user or as somebody who's maybe like a novice developer could go in, copy my code, and stand up your own version of my game because maybe you don't agree with you know some of the decisions I've made. So that's a really special thing. So that's you know that's one way we're sort of taking a different approach. And and that all that means is that it just creates a healthy ecosystem for uh, the game. It creates survivability and it allows for unique ideas to uh, be acted upon without having to worry about some big lawyer 
sending you a cease and desist letter to your house. And then the second piece of that, more related to the blockchain, and this is really what the problem the blockchain solves, I would say, in this case, is that with all these other games like Hearthstones, let's say you spent $500 to buy as many Hearthstone packs as you could. If tomorrow Blizzard all of a sudden had to fire their whole Hearthstone team and turn off all the servers, you don't get any of that back. You've lost it. It's gone for good. Um, and there's nothing you can do about that. There's no no legal action you can take. You When you sign up for their end user terms and agreements, every time you play the game, you see that little thing pop up. That's what you're agreeing to. Is the fact that they own um, the digital assets, even though you paid for it. It's kind of an interesting legal loophole, I guess. But needless to say, that is the case. And you see it happen all the time. Like a good example, um, when they shut down uh, like the old World of Warcraft servers. You know, you might have spent 200 hours in that game. Um, and many people like to make analogies, you know, time is money, money is time. I mean, you lost those 200 hours, you lost all that progress, you lost all everything, and there's nothing you can do to get that back. So I take that tangent because it's important to understand how the blockchain helps with that problem. The way that blockchain helps with that problem is that, you know, in, in Blitz, it's the trading cards themselves, right? So when when you open a pack of cards, you'll get uh, at this time, you know, five cards out of that pack. Each of those cards are a token on the blockchain. And really what you own at that point is the character. You own the identity of the card. So, you know, if you want to collect one of our, you know, fan favorites is Margo, the jester character with a big old scythe. Um, you know, she runs around going crazy. You basically own Margo. That's an interesting notion, right? Because what that means is that, you know, you or anybody watching this video could go stand up their own version of Blitz. You would already know that people own Margo. You can then reference that same Margo in your game. So the user will not have to purchase Margo twice. If I have to shut down Blitz's servers because I don't know, I go bankrupt, <laughs> let's hope that on them, or, you know, something, something like that occurs, that's actually totally fine. Your assets aren't gone, right? You still own the characters. You still own the cards. And so all it would take is one person to say, you know what? I really like Blitz. I'm just going to spin up their instance on my computer. I'm going to change a few things because, you know, screw Mick and the decisions he made. I'm going to change a few things. That guy didn't know what he was doing. And But then you do, like the users wouldn't have to purchase anything. They'd still have their cards. And, and that's, you know, to go back to the problem, that solves the problem of these big corporations being able to take that from you without like any notice whatsoever. It's a beautiful thing. And it's like a realistic thing that the blockchain is able to solve that uh, standard and typical databases cannot. So that really reminds me of essentially the, the argument between paying for Spotify Mm -hmm. or iTunes, as opposed to going out and getting your vinyl or your tape or your CD, where mm -hmm. you physically have that copy that is yours that they can't really tell you when and where you can yeah. play it, yep. as opposed to you have no internet, you have no stream, as yep. far as that goes. But also, yeah. also, so with these, with owning this asset, mm -hmm. you, you mentioned that somebody could spin up their own server. Mm -hmm. um, could not also somebody from like, uh, Cyberverse, who is mm -hmm. another uh, game on the Ergo blockchain, couldn't they say, look, we we love uh, Blitz TCG, mm -hmm. and um, we would like to say, if you come and play a little bit of Cyberverse, we're going to look in that wallet that you have when mm -hmm. you log into the system, and we're going to take these you know, this amount of cards and we've made characters in, or you've made, you know, aliases yep. inside Cyberverse to be able to actually utilize those cards in our game as well. And yes. you couldn't yes. do a damn thing about it because nope. that's their property. And it's a, honestly a beautiful thing. I love it. Uh, and in fact, I encourage it for Blitz. We have this, um, I wouldn't even, it's not a partnership. I wouldn't even call it a collaboration, just a goodwill gesture to the Hosky community on Cardano where we design two Blitz cards. And the way you unlock those cards is by simply having at least one Hosky in your Cardano wallet, which costs like at this point, less than zero somehow. <laughs> and uh, they'll like that I said that. And then, uh, um, 
And then for the other card, you have to have one Hosky NFT. And so if you have the one Hosky token, you get a Blitz card for free. You unlock it. If you get, uh, if you want the second card, you have to have at least one Hosky uh, NFT. And again, it just blows my mind, like that people don't do that. We have the opportunity with the vast number of projects that are in the blockchain space to make each of our projects more valuable by including each other in each other's projects. But for some reason, n nobody does it in our space. It like blows my mind because it goes back to greed. And I don't mean to throw any of these people under the bus. I mean, there's a lot of good projects out there, I'm sure. But people don't do it because they feel like it distracts from their game and their ownership, right? I didn't even ask the Hosky crew for any funding. I paid for the cards myself because I thought it would be damn cool to just show people how easy this is. It took me five minutes to code it. Five minutes. It's because I already have my Cardano integration, right? So I just said, hey, what's your guys' like token address? Oh, it's it's that? Great. Thanks. And then I put if token greater than or equal to one unlock this dog card <laughs> you know like this dog like, card <laughs> it's not hard it's dude i'm not a good program i'm really not i taught myself everything i have known up to this point from starting this project and like if i can figure that out dude there is no excuse <laughs> like it's it's really i can't explain to you how easy it is it's like it's like baffles me that people aren't more open to that Anyway, I could talk about that for too long, so we'll we'll get past it. <laughs> That's amazing. So, what what about in the future? Where I'm getting totally off tangent here. Yeah. But what about in the future where you could have a, a like a community uh, GitHub section where people could vote on cards that they want integrated yeah. into your servers? Yep. And then you do the commit. Yeah, dude, we've 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 actually explored that. Like, I think for both card balance and addition of community cards, um. All of that is possible. And like, I'm, the, I'm really more of the type of mind, like people try to use the blockchain for that. They call it governance, right? But frankly, like, and that's, again, I don't want to rub people the wrong way. It's just my opinion. Like a lot of people just make up tokens for the sake of having a token. <laughs> this is the honest truth, dude. Survey Monkey can give me the same results that a blockchain vote could give me for my game. Right, like in this specific case, I don't need governance tokens, right? Like that's silly. Right? I just don't like. Well, like who? I don't. I don't. And also, I don't want people who have a hundred thousand governance tokens to have more of a say than somebody that has ten. I just want you to be able to give your opinion about the game's direction. I do think you know that's the flip side. So I feel like I'm playing catch twenty two here with the blockchain. I think you know my frame of mind is use the blockchain for what it's good at and use traditional technology for what it's good at, bring the two together in like this really nice harmony uh, that makes everybody's experiences better. Like, I think it's pretty, it hurts me to see like people using the blockchain for the same thing it was meant to prevent, which which was like, you know, like it's just it's strange. I don't know, it just doesn't, it's never felt right with me. So I'm trying to avoid that in its entirety with Blizzard. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's inevitable. <laughs> that's like the scorpion and the frog, you know? You, yes, yes, yes. It's, it's, yes. it's what it is. Um, people will have to Google that, but that's fine. <laughs> I'm, oh, that's right. That might be age dating me quite a bit. <laughs> that's right. That's, fine. that's their homework. That's fine. That's cool. All right. So the final question I have for you. Yeah. Why Ergo? What What's so special about and unique about Ergo that made you want to develop on this with this chain? Yeah, I, I typically answer this question the same way. And it, I don't think my response has changed over the many times I've asked it, the first, it's, it's a, a couple bullets. So I'll, I'll walk down my little list here. The first thing, first and foremost, like I said, I had no coding experience. Um, I was just an investor in the blockchain, a bunch of blockchain technology um, for a long time, many, many years. And I, I follow the Reddits, I follow the posts, you know, all that lovely stuff. And I just stumbled across Ergo one day because I saw somebody talking about it in a community that I was a part of at the time. So I hopped over into our subreddit uh, well before it was, you know, multiple thousands of people. And I just like read the post and like everybody's super nice and everybody's like really collaborative. And, you know, I come from a place of, I would say, passion with a lot of things I do. And I could like feel the passion of these people. 
and it honestly, dude, it just made me, I'm like, man, like I can get behind this, like in no community I've ever been a part of in crypto, have I actually felt genuine passion and honestly, not a lot of talk about price. Like you always hear people like when, when tier one exchange, but I know whatever that's always going to happen with any, with any, <laughs> yeah, every project asks that no matter how big it is, they always want to know what's next. So that's fine. But like, there was never much discussion about, you know, the, the price it was it was always about like you know what problem are we solving how can we solve it better than it has been solved before you know and epo pals and, and stuff that ergo's working on these lightweight clients stuff that's like i don't know man stuff that's just kind of makes a lot of sense if you ever want blockchain to be like a real thing for public use seems like ergo has already really thought about a lot of that. I didn't know that at the time. So the reason to answer your question, <laughs> the reason I decided to put Blitz on Ergo first and foremost was because of the support I got from the community. And that's the honest truth. Like, you know, I, I gave this idea, uh, I posted it on Reddit, got a huge amount of traction. Like people were super pumped. That motivated me. I'm just like, man, you know, if like, if like, I can even get five people to continue to engage with me. How fun would this be to, to work on? And I just rode that high for a little bit, honestly. Like, you know, you know how it is. Like, you know, people are like, oh, this is a great idea. They pat you on the back. Like I rode that high for a long time, but then I started to learn more and more and more. And, and I came to realize like, man, not only is this community passionate about something they believe in, but it's like a genuine and earnest belief in, in what they believe in. So I dug deeper and I, started watching some of the YouTube tutorials on, on how Ergo works behind the scenes. You know, what is the E in EUTXO, right? Like, what does that actually mean? Um, and then it only like, as, as, cause Blitz was still very early on at this point, right? I'm still just playing around with ideas, writing the initial white paper. So the project could have easily been canceled. Um, and like, the more I learned, the more I'm just like, man, this is really unique and really interesting. It seems to be, very user centric, like low gas fees. We just want the best experience for the people, power to the people, right? Um, and I, I had a pretty extensive background with ERC twenty, um, Ethereum's, you know, Ethereum's tokens, and uh, it's just, it just doesn't feel that way over there. And I don't mean to throw that community on the bus. I, I still have a, a, a lot of good relations in that community, um, but the fact of the matter is, you know. <laughs> You have to have what, like 32 ETH nowadays to even have a, a stake in yep, anything in exactly. a decision. That's 50 grand, bro. <laughs> like, I, like, there's just some decisions over there that I look back on. I'm like, man, you know, as long as Ergo never does stuff like that, I'll continue to, to trust it and have faith in it. And that's why, man, that's why I stick with it, stick with it to this day. And I'll be honest with you. And people pretend like it's really hard to do this stuff and like make these switches, especially for, for games. It's not, man. Like if at any point in this development process, because I haven't released the NFTs or the, the tokens yet, if, at any point in these two years that I've worked on this project, I'm like, man, Argo's not the right choice. Like I'm going to go use, you know, Sally Sue blockchain. Uh, I could have done it and just like without any hiccup in my development, because it, it's just like very basic code to, to query the blockchain and get the data you need. Yep. Um. But I haven't just like after that amount of time, after seeing that amount of data, the staying with the community, exploring other options, I've actually expanded to a couple other blockchains. But Ergo is still my number one, without a doubt. That's awesome. That's amazing. Yeah. And what about the what about specifically? And you mentioned like you know, there are these simple connections mm -hmm. that, that you mm -hmm. make for your game, at least to Ergo. Mm -hmm. What um, what about the tooling uh, makes Ergo attractive as far as that goes? Are you, are you a, um, uh, what's it called? Are you coding directly to the blockchain with the, with the toolkits, the app kits that um, the APIs that um, Ergo puts down? Or are you using like Fleet SDK or MGPy mm -hmm. to do some of your connections and talk to the blockchain? Well, as of recently, now we're doing a little bit of everything. So like the, the game itself, this gets a little technical, but I'll keep it high level. The game itself, very simple in that all it does is, again, utilize what I think are the best technologies that are known and trusted to serve certain purposes. So like, you're, like a, the user, 
is on Firebase, which is a very trusted Google-based backend. And that user account, like when you sign up for Blitz on the website, you can connect your ergo, you can connect your ergo wallet. And when I say connect, all that means is you press connect and you press sign on Nautilus and it sends your public address to Firebase. So now you have, you know, Mick Blackwell, uh, username low key nerd, you know, some other random crap about my user, and it says Ergo Wallet, and it has that address. Okay, so now what can we do with that? Well, now that address, very easily discoverable from in the game itself. Don't have to do anything too super crazy to find it. So when you start the game, all that it does is use a, a very simple like web-based query where it takes that text string and it sort of plugs it into the URL that you need to query. And then it goes, finds all your tokens. It just kind of takes a snapshot of it, brings it back into the game. That's enough for anything in the game, right? Because all I need to do is keep track of your tokens. No reason for it to be more complicated than that. Uh, doesn't benefit the user for it to be more complicated than that, um, or me for that matter. Now, that being said, um, you know, I would say that's a very like a uh, surface level integration with Ergo from that perspective. As of recently, and I'm very excited about this, I've been partnering with LGD, who is a very well-known developer in our community. He works with many different projects, has some of his pro some projects of his own. Brilliant guy, um, and I, I truly enjoy uh, working with him. Um, and we have weekly, weekly meetings in there. It's some of my favorite meetings every week. But anyways, what we're doing is standing up a hard burn contract that hope, hopefully is agnostic enough that other projects can make use of too on the Ergo blockchain. So what we're designing, um, which is basically, you know, he's putting code to my idea uh, and, and our, my continued ideas is a way for like, you know, one of the problems like with Pokemon, I have thousands of Pokemon cards, dude, and I open hundreds of packs. There are maybe if I open 100 packs, there's maybe 10 cards I even care to keep. The rest of them you get thrown into a bin in the basement or actually thrown out, which is sad. And they're just wasted. They're gone forever. So it would be really nice for the user with a digital card game, specifically because you're able to do it much easier, is what if you know I open 10 Blitz packs and I got five of the same card. I only want to keep one of them. I look to the open market. They're not really selling for anything. I don't want to go through the trouble of like selling this card to another user. Uh, in Pokemon, you could consider that trading or putting it on eBay or something, right? Instead, I want to burn it, right? So meaning I'm going to take this card and I'm going to throw it against Ergo and Ergo, <laughs> their smart contract going to give me back uh, some amount of, of tokens for my, for my card. The way we're doing this is entirely different than it's ever been done before on any blockchain. And I've talked to two economists at this point, <laughs> without exaggeration. Uh, we do not know what's going to happen. So, so basically, the way this is going to work is there's going to be no pre-mint of tokens at all. So there's going to be just this lockbox that sits behind the scenes and the only time tokens are generated are when users burn a card. So the max supply is technically if burn all cards times card value equal max supply. But there'll never be that amount of the supply in the ecosystem because all the cards will never be burned. Um, it's just a really unique way of handling it because it's it's what I'm terming as like a closed loop economy where the inputs truly do equal the outputs and there's never there's never you never have to worry about more of like ingestion from a seller standpoint or some weird like tokenomics thing behind the background. It's literally the only tokens that are generated are from the cards that are burnt and there is never anything outside of that. Very different. And the reason it's different is because, again, it's a less greedy approach. Most projects, and sometimes it's not just greed, sometimes they really do need the funding. So I don't want to you know, say that everybody that has a pre-mint is a greedy monster. That's not true. But sometimes it is. Uh, for Blitz, like we've talked about, I'm not super monetarily incentivized. So 
I was just like, man, you know, what would happen? It's almost like proof of burn, right? It's like, what if, what if we only generated tokens based on the cars that are burned? And what LGD and I are doing now, which is kind of cool, is there's going to be having points. So, <laughs> like, when you burn, like, let's say when the 10th, thousandth card is burned i don't know what the number is going to be your rewards are going to be half so every oh, card gosh. burn isn't that cool so yeah. every card burn after that will be worth half as much and then after another ten thousand cards it'll be half again and again and indefinitely so it's literally like we're programming a little mini blockchain that's not really a blockchain on the ergo blockchain um wow. and it's just something i know i know has never been like nothing like that has ever been done before like i'm fully confident um like it just is is like an untested thing uh but it has the potential to be like pretty wild i think <laughs> so, so <laughs> like i don't like nobody really knows what's 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 gonna you're, happen you're actually minting a token each you're not like you're not like minting everything at once and then putting it into a smart track contract and then releasing it as they're burnt you're mm -hmm. you're actually making an actual token at the time of, of burn of the might, other one? You'd have to talk to LGD about it, honestly. Like, e either way, whether they're all minted up front, like, it's completely inaccessible. So, like, there's only one of two ways to do it. It could be the way you described, or it could be we just mint the highest number of tokens ever possible for any token to be minted, whatever the max number of decimals is, and we just throw it into, you know... A smart a, contract. A, a yeah. smart contract. Yep. Um, but either way, the the outcome is... It's ultimately the same. the same. Yeah, Correct. it's ultimately the same. It's probably whatever is easiest, frankly, which yeah, I imagine is probably the, uh, the probably the latter. The smart contract. Yeah, well, there yeah. there is there is um, EIP thirty four, I believe, mm -hmm. which in Ergo allows you to uh, do an open kind of not an open contract mm -hmm. as far as Cardano goes, but mm -hmm. you can mint something and then later mint something else and tie mm -hmm. it into that previous mint, so that you have you can have a collection essentially. That's right. Based on that, so yeah, that's, we, that's possible. That'd be interesting. That'd be really yeah, interesting. Yeah, there are some there are some assumptions and stuff that have to be made, and we're we're trying to figure out the best way to do that. A lot of projects don't tell you that, you know. Ultimately, for these types of things, there's only like a minimal amount of authority needed to screw it all up, and oftentimes it's the developer's public and private, or in this case, private key, right? And really, that's against, in my opinion, kind of the whole purpose of the blockchain in general, in that you shouldn't have to just trust one person and not screw something up. And so even if every person on the planet trusted me, you shouldn't have to just trust me to not screw up a beautiful idea. So one of the things like LGD and I have been talking about, and it's a bit TBD at this point on how we're going to approach it, is sort of uh, what the Cardano community often does, which is like multi-sig confirmation, where you have to go out and, you know, I'll just, I'll nominate like a few people, like, you know, maybe um, a few of the trusted Ergo Foundation members uh, maybe LGT himself. So we have like this congregation of people that, for example, when Blitz is ready to mint a new set, as you just described, that has to then be eligible to burn against that existing pile. It takes all those people to to agree to do that. Um, or, you know, this might also be one of the few cases where I might actually agree that a governance token might be useful. Because maybe the community is like, we don't want any more cards, which will never happen. But let's just say maybe it gets to the point where they're like, we don't want any more cards right now. You know, focus on the game. And that does happen sometimes. Like gamers say stuff like that, right? Maybe that might be a good use case for governance. Like have people vote on the fact that like we're going to introduce this new set. That's that's in full transparency TBD right now. But what I don't want to have happen is have all the trust and decision making come back down to one person. Because again, that's against, in my opinion, like, the benefit of the blockchain in the first place. So more to, more to come on that piece of it, but the elegance of it, and interesting part to me, is uh, <laughs> the fact that no one has any idea what the hell is going to happen <laughs> once you're able to burn cards against it, because it just hasn't been done. Like that, That'll be no, interesting. Nobody does that. Yeah, nobody does what we're about to do. So you could I don't have, know. You could have some interesting rarities come across for people burning cards that they think are numerous, yeah. and all of a sudden, oh my God, there's only three and of these gone. cards left. Yeah, yep. well, so that's why I think it's just going to be wild. Like, even if just 100 people trade this stuff, right? Let's just say 100 people, which is a very approachable number based off of 
Um, we have over 100 people signed up already that have wallet addresses associated to their accounts. <laughs> so like clearly there's some trust um, and all that. But I mean, even if 100 people trade this stuff, like like you're saying, if if you if you got lazy and you wanted to burn like, you know, the one out of a hundred pack Margo card, like finding a Charizard, and you say, I don't want to sell this, I want to burn it. Like maybe you just burned one of three in existence at mm -hmm. this point, right? So you've basically uh increased the rarity by 33% or more than that, right? Like it's like it's just uh so your your back end will essentially track that, right? It'll it'll mm -hmm. you'll scan for burnt cards and then mm -hmm. up the rarity rating based on yeah, that. Yeah, LGD is doing some crazy, crazy stuff. And it'll all be open source, so people will be able to take a look at it. Um so this, you know, just like blitz the game. The, and just and all just that'll for, be open source too. That, that's awesome. That's awesome. And just for our listeners too, as you yeah. were explaining about smart contracts earlier too, for those that don't know. Mm -hmm. So well, well, Mick, you were speaking about trust, you know. Mm -hmm. You can, so I could, I could open up a wallet. I could mint some tokens, put them in there and say, look, I'm never going to touch this. I threw away the, the secret key to access mm -hmm. it. You have mm -hmm. to trust me there. Okay. Yep. You have to trust that I actually threw away the, the key for that kind of thing. So what smart contracts are amazing. And also Aragon, but I'm sure other places mm -hmm. that have smart contracts is you can create the smart contract, Mick, you can dump your tokens in there. And yep. put them either on an emission schedule or put them on a, you know, a couple of easy if then statements. If mm -hmm. user sends this card to this smart contract, then right. pay out this much. Right. And it's all autonomous. There's no trust. Mick, you can't even go in and do nope. a damn thing about it. So nope. that's nope. that's that's the beauty of this whole system. Once it's set, it's set. That's right. Yeah. I mean, it's yep. a curse and a blessing at some time. It is. You hit go and you're like, oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, basically, you can't really make a mistake up front, especially with yeah. some. You, I mean, you can, right? So there's ways around it. Like, you can, um, at the end of the day, for people to be able to do the card burn, you effectively have to have somebody running uh, that bot, basically. You have to have somebody running and executing on that on that transaction. Right, which kind of makes sense, I think, to most people. So if like we realize we made an awful mistake, and it'll probably like you'll find out pretty quick. I mean, everybody will know very quickly if somebody makes a mistake, and it does happen sometimes. Like people do make mistakes with this sort of stuff. Like there are some ways out of it, and this is just for transparency for the community. Um, it's always good for any project to think through worst case. So here's the worst case. Here, we kick this off, and I don't know. We we put a zero somewhere it shouldn't be, right? And like all of a sudden, like people are getting way more tokens for certain things than we thought. And it's it's going to drain the supply. Well, the good news is it's not going to really affect the cards at all because the tokens are being generated based on the cards that are burned. So your cards are still fine. That's going to be, you know, nice and sedentary, like like a calm river uh, at all times. So then we got to be like, all right, hold up. So we'll, we'll shut down, shut down, ask people to shut down the bots, basically send out a public server and sounds like, hey, don't burn your cards against this smart contract anymore. Like we're going to take a snapshot in time and we're going to we're going to spin up a new version of this. We're going to fix our mistake. We're going to uh, send you out some form of compensation, airdrop, figure it out, right? We'll figure it out for um, the tokens you did have at the time of this snapshot. And then moving forward, Please, for the love of God, only, you know, use the approved uh, smart contract. So, like, you know, it's 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 always good. No one ever talks about this stuff because, like, it's like, what do you mean there could be a problem? Like, what do you mean something can go wrong? Dude, the shit developers don't tell you, man, is wild, right? Like, like people the have no popsicle idea. Popsicle sticks and duct tape in the back end. Bro, and, <laughs> and you know, to, for me, man, I think Joe says it best. He, honestly, this sticks with me so much. Joe Joe Armini, he's, he's part of the Ergo Foundation or part of the, you know, he does he does a lot for Ergo, I guess. And uh, he always says he says this one phrase I love. It. He's like, "Know your assumptions, right? Know your assumptions." And I think that's a beautiful thing to say in the blockchain space, where like, I just think it's so hypocritical. Where like nobody's transparent, and the whole point of blockchain was to be transparent, <laughs> but nobody's transparent, right? So for me, like, I think it's fine to talk about, like, what is a cataclysmic event for Blitz? Well, frankly, the cards themselves, you never have to worry about. They're just like standard um, NFT style minting procedures. Like those are things, those things I really, 
like they're fine like you, you you buy a pack you open the pack you get some cards like there's nothing like fancy going on there right it's Stuff very in your wallet yep they're good very simple stuff and and then with the card burn so let's say the card well let's say let's just use a more realistic example because the one i i put you know lgd's on the case so i doubt something like that's going to happen but more realistic scenario is maybe there's some economic effect that is just awful for the user right maybe i don't even know what this could be maybe like some crazy pro let's just go here here's a good example some insano person comes in they buy a hundred thousand dollars worth of blix blitz packs they open them all they spend eight days opening them all because i don't even know how long it would take to execute all those those transactions so they spend over a hundred thousand dollars because because of the a little bit of the gas fee associated with what they're trying to do all right so now they have five hundred thousand blitz cards and they're like, <laughs> I'm gonna burn all these cards, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna trick the system. So then they go. There's gonna be some limit on the amount of cards you can burn at once. At this point, LGD and I are thinking like between five to ten of the same type of card at one time to help prevent weird stuff like this from happening. Well, let's say they do that. Number one, I'm rich, so great, right? Because they bought a hundred thousand dollar pack, so good for Blitz. Uh, bad for anybody that has Blitz tokens, because now this stupid person is gonna be like, oh, I'm about to burn all these cards ha, ha 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 but even in that case you'd have to be a complete idiot to do that it's similar to like certain types of 51 percent attacks on the blockchain because the amount of money that user would have to one spend to do that and two get back would it would cost them a fortune like they lose all their money they actually wouldn't gain anything because one the volume of the blitz token won't be high enough for them to sell all that so the price would effectively be driven down to zero. So they just screw themselves um, out of that out of that money. So those are, you know, there are actually fifty one percent attacks out there like that where technically it is possible to conduct these types of attacks on blockchains, but people don't do them because it literally is dumb. Like you'd mm -hmm. have you like you're just like or you might as well just burn a pile of money. Um, but there's inter like we've thought through a lot of that stuff, right? And I continue to think through stuff like that because you, if you don't and you pretend that everything is going to be all warm and fuzzy, uh, I mean, you're kind of a liar and you're kind of not doing your users' diligence. Like you're not you're not actually thinking through the consequences of your actions. Like that that meme of like Britney Spears, that kid thinking you guys don't understand the consequences or whatever the hell he says. I don't know. It's oh, fun that stuff. Guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. <laughs> I dude, do. I do. He had a, they had a renaissance, I think, actually, where, you know, when it came up how badly Britney was being yeah. abused and then yeah. they were like, they should listen to that guy, you know? Like, should listen. <laughs> they were right. Yeah. I mean, they were too, technically, right? Yeah. Your act. Oh, that's it. Your actions have consequences. Yeah. That's what, that's what it reminds me of. And, and legitimately, like, it's just wild, man. Anyways. Yeah. But yeah, this is a lot. I think we got deep on that, but it's no, important. No, that's fine. Yeah, it's important. That is a that's, project. That's a, that's a beauty of the open source, um, open source ecosystem and mantra of of Ergo. Essentially, yep. you know, it's 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 amazing that somebody like you could come out and say, "Well, you know, here's our game. We did a damn good job on it. We mm -hmm. have some amazing devs on it." But you know, this could happen. <laughs> and hopefully we get to a point where uh, in society, at least, or else blockchain uptick in mm -hmm. usage where people can, you know, feel comfortable about that kind of thing where right. they, you know, they should, they should feel just as uncomfortable as going to their bank and asking for Absolutely. money than, Absolutely. than hearing you say that something could mm -hmm. screw up, but people don't, they blindly yeah. trust that kind of stuff. They're like, yeah. oh, my bank's got it. It's FDIC insured, yep. all that good stuff. But, you know. Yep. Uh, obviously, yeah. we just saw what several months ago on those bank runs that nope, they don't they don't have you. Yeah, there's still yeah. I mean, there's you know, in the blockchain, do you know, like everyone likes to grandstand on the fact that like, even I just did it. You grandstand on the fact that a smart contract is open source, but bro, how many people you actually think can go in there and read that? <laughs> I I can barely follow LGD's logic. Like he he spent. That's what our Friday meetings are. It's just him educating me on his code. That's all it is. He's just educating me on his code. And that's for somebody that does develop for a couple hours a day. Or I might not be the best, but I'm certainly not the worst. So to, to think that that statement means anything at all to your typical person who goes into a bank is a ridiculous notion. 
It's a ridiculous notion. Yep. So like it is important that it's open source and it does of course add to more security and more vetting for the broader community when you're somebody who can actually like confirm what another person's saying is true, which is the 1% of people maybe well less than well I mean probably a hundredth of a percent of people in this community right it's like a fraction of the people can actually do that so we have a lot of work to do as people developing on the blockchain as companies and just as users of crypto in general to like demystify some of that stuff and I think this is where it starts like you just got to be like yeah you know shit happens we're doing our best to make sure it doesn't happen this is what we thought about could happen. This is how we're trying to prevent it from happening. I look at it, Mick, I look at it as, we're getting really philosophical. Yeah, here. yeah, it's like, I'm really <laughs> philosophical, but it's fun, right? Like, it's interesting. I, I look at it as more of a, you know, when you walk into a bank or a store, that kind of thing, you're, you're yeah. putting a trust in probably a few individuals. Yep. Whereas, whereas where, you know, somebody says, oh, it's open source and that kind of thing. What I hear is, yeah, you know, I may not look at the open source tooling or, you know, really look into that smart cash and see what it is, but there's a distributed collective trust, I guess, if I can use those two words together. Mm -hmm. There's a trust that there's not somebody out there that, uh, you know, maybe reads through it, notifies the community, it, you're distributing that 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 um, yeah. You're distributing the trust across all yeah. those all those people that are involved yeah. in it. Look at let's look at um, TrueCrypt. TrueCrypt was mm. this amazing tool, or still is maybe maybe it's not anymore. Mm. This amazing encryption tool that you could do full encryptions of your hard drive. You could do shadow drives, hidden oh, yeah. drives. Amazing amazing array of things with TrueCrypt. Huh. And maybe like ten years ago. They came out and said, oh, crap, there's this we found a vulnerability in here. Everybody upgrade, you know, that kind of thing. Or somebody injected a vulnerability or something was there. And everybody trusted that for so long up until that point. But wow. you know, the important thing is that the collective trust, the collective community was there looking at it. And even though it might only take one person, the distributedness of the tooling and the trust there enables that to come out in that. Open. Yeah. That's what that's what open source means to me. It doesn't mean, you know, I'm specific. I'm, I'm going to be looking at that contract necessarily. It means that I'm now trusting hopefully a broader range of a community yeah. as opposed to there. And I hate to say trust, but I mean, but that is, but that's the, and that's, yeah. but, but and that's the thing I want everybody to be, you know, as we all become more educated about how this stuff works, that is ultimately what it comes down to. You are, you are trusting a wider range of people, but you are still trusting people. You are still like, when I say, our project's open source. You're like, ah, oh, that's great, Mick. Like, I'm glad you did that. Like, that means we've really looked at it. Dude, what if, like, I made it open source and not a single soul has ever looked at it? I, I, like, then it doesn't, it doesn't, I almost <laughs> dropped the bad word. Then it doesn't matter mm -hmm. at all if it's open source, actually, right? It doesn't matter one bit. Um, what if you're running different code that you published to GitHub, you know? I mean, who knows? That's, and that's, I mean, that's a risk people run in some, and there's been cases of that happening, right? Like there's, you know, people just don't, um, they don't know enough about how all the, 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 even the intelligent, I want to say intelligent, that's wrong. Even the less ignorant folks in our community, the people who are, who are educated don't really understand how all that stuff works behind the scenes. So the fact that, you know, we think like a normal user is like like blockchains ready for industry adoption, dude. Maybe, man. Maybe. Like I think there's still some work to be done on it. That's why nobody, you know, that's why you have all these political political heads and stuff and people fighting it because people don't understand the bare minimum enough to know like sort of the arguments you were making. So I don't know. We we can we can end that there. I I just think there's a lot of work to be done. And I think you have to start with projects like this, like Blitz, frankly where it's just so, so transparent. Like you, you just can't get any more. Like it's almost like transparent to the risk of fault, right? <laughs> like it's almost too transparent. Like you almost don't want to know what's going on. Like, don't show me that. Yeah, <laughs> right? the, like the I next, don't even want to know. The next right? step, Mick, is for you to just publish your um, login keys to the servers. I you're might as well. And be like, dude, here they yeah. are, guys. Take a look. <laughs> Take a look. Hop on into the GitHub. Yeah, dig it out. <laughs> dig it out. Yeah. Yeah, man. I don't know. I don't know. You know, there's only so much you can do and still at some point you got to 
every time you type in an address in your Google search bar or your Google Chrome browser, you're trusting somebody, dude. Oh yeah, DNS poisoning. We can get all technical on that. It's it's, yep. it's crazy. Yep. Every time. Anyways, yep. it's interesting, yeah. man. All right, yeah. let's let's uh, let's close this up with yeah, a question that I don't know if I've asked you this before, mm. but um, what's it look like for nearing um, some more public testing or public playing or that kind of thing for uh, CTG? It's it's really exciting, man. Like we've we've had some community play tests. A handful of folks got together. We put it on Twitch, and we just had a good time with it. It's just more functional testing at this point, making sure people can log in. Uh, making sure like data is behaving the way it should behave on different people's PCs and connections are remaining stable across countries. Uh, there isn't a great way to test that, really. You just kind of have to, you know, that's why AAA game studios have awful launches sometimes because that shit's hard to test mm -hmm. uh, without actually having some reality to it. So that's kind of the goal behind that. Um, for launch, I think at this point, the only thing that, uh, I might not be able to get far enough as a gamer to be satisfied with the state of the game is animations. I've learned a lot through this project. And one of the things I've learned is it's hard to find somebody to do animations for the amount of money uh, that Blitz has available to spend on the project. But I think, you know, at the very least, well, I don't think I know that before we sell anything, at the very least, the game will be playable in full, might not be shiny. It might not be to the point at which I, I want it to be, um, but it will be completely playable. You'll be able to use everything that you purchase in the way that it was meant to be used, which is key. Um, and then we'll have, I'll try to put together some some reasonable development roadmap, basically sort of like, oh, I'm almost thinking of like Kickstarter, but like the reverse of Kickstarter. Basically like I've launched my game, it is playable, Let's track, and it'll be public because you'll be able to see the address the funds get sent to. Let's track how much money Blitz has made. And so we can build a little tracker, like a little little thermometer, basically like, you know, if a thousand packs are sold, right? That means I can now allocate this much money toward improving this aspect of the game. And then like the next thermometer bubble, so on and so forth. I think that'd be a beautiful way to like involve the community and be very transparent about like how much we think it's going to cost to do certain things. Um, so that's also something I've been playing around with in relation to community testing. I'm excited, man. It's cool. It's getting to the point where it's like pretty well-tuned, at least from a foundational perspective. That's awesome. That's good to yeah. hear, Mick. Yeah, man. All right, let's wrap it up. Um, uh, thanks so much for talking about the game and talking a little bit about the history of what how you perceive gaming in general and on the blockchain i yeah, think man. um i hope that the people watching get a good insight of i know that every time i talk to you i get that feeling of rekindled of what ergo is all about and yeah <laughs> the passion comes right why and that's here. that's and that's why when you said why ergo that's why because that's this is what it's it that's what it is right you feel it it's like a mm -hmm. community thing it feels good you're like yeah let's let's keep going you know i don't know it's cool man <laughs> All right, like thanks. That. Thanks, Mick. Have a good one. Yeah, thanks, brother. Thanks, brother.